Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us for this virtual meeting of the DNC Rules and Bylaws Committee. I'm uh, Lorraine Miller, and I'm from the cold, great state of Texas. And along with my friend Jim Roosevelt from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, we serve as the co-chairs of the DNC Rules and Bylaws Committee. For anybody we haven't had a chance to say Happy New Year to, Happy New Year. We appreciate you taking the time to join us today. Jim and I hope that you are all doing well and staying safe and healthy. We are in unprecedented times and we don't take for granted each of you for all the work that you do to make sure our party continues to function during these really unprecedented times. I don't know about you, but I am so pleased. Well, let me just say, I shout for joy every day watching President Biden and Vice President Harris get right to work and lead our nation with thoughtfulness and compassion. What a change an election makes. As a reminder, this is an official meeting of the committee. So we are live streaming these proceedings on these DNC YouTube channel so that we can have an official record of our deliberations. Please join me in reciting the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, uh, indivisible, indivisible, with liberty, with liberty justice, 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 Great, thank you. <clears throat> we will now uh, call the roll to determine if we have a quorum. Recognize Patrice Taylor to call the roll. Patrice? Hi, good afternoon. Um, Mr. Berman? And I see that members are raising their hands uh, to let us know that they are here. Ms. Blanco? Uh, Ms. Brazil? Peace. And Ms. Brazil has given her proxy to uh, Bishop Daughtry in the event that she has to leave before our meeting is over. Uh, Mr. Brennan? Present. Ms. Cardona <clears throat> has given her proxy to Jason Ray. Bishop Daughtry? Present. Ms. Gerardo Roker? Presente. Ms. Higgins? Here. Mr. Ickes? Here. <clears throat> Ms. Kmark has given her proxy to Mr. Roosevelt. Ms. Lewis? Here. Mr. Liu? Here. Ms. Martinez? Presente. Uh, Mr. McDonald? Here. Mr. Martin has given his proxy to Mr. Zodi. 
Ms. Moore? Present. Ms. Mount? Here. Uh, Mr. Nutter? Here. Mr. Ray? Here. Ms. Ruiz? Mr. Saunders? Here. Mr. Spate? Here. Uh, Ms. Swecker? Here. Uh, Ms. Weingarten? Here. And Ms. Weingarten, I know that you have given your president, uh, your proxy to Mr. Lee in the event that you have to leave before the meeting is over. Thank you. And Mr. Zodi. Here. And with that, Madam uh, Co-Chair and Mr. Co-Chair, you have a- Great, thanks Patrice. Um, <clears throat> so we have a quorum and a quorum is constituted by 40% in person or by proxy. This virtual meeting is an official meeting of the RBC, and therefore the attendance requirements in the DNC bylaws will apply. As a reminder, members, members who miss three consecutive meetings are deemed to have resigned from the committee. Registering a proxy while important for establishing a quorum and assuring your vote is represented does not count for the purposes of attending a meeting. In addition to the RBC members on the line, we are also joined by DNC staff, our lovely DNC Council Graham Wilson and Addie Levin, and our parliamentarian Helen McFadden. They are here to help us make sure our meetings run smoothly. Now I'll turn it over to my partner in crime, Jim Roosevelt. Thanks very much, Lorraine. Um, it is good to be with all of you. I want to join Lorraine in hoping that you and your families are doing well and staying safe and healthy. As we begin this meeting, because it is our first meeting since last June, we would be remiss if we didn't take just a minute to remember our friend and colleague, Don Fowler. Don, as you all know, is a former member of this committee uh, uh, and uh, of course, a distinguished former chair of the DNC. He passed away on December 15. Each of us has our own fond memories of Don from our interactions with him at RBC meetings. Um, I know personally from some good times uh, over perhaps uh, a glass of a number of things afterwards uh, uh, and, some, and some great dinners and great conversations. Indeed, I had the privilege of uh, joining him in his classes at the University of South Carolina and the Citadel from time to time. Uh, as well as some family events. And I just miss him every day. Uh, the, uh, what we know as DNC members is that his legacy will live on. It will live in our hearts. It will live in the work he did tirelessly to strengthen our party. It will live in the rules of our party that he helped craft and fine tune over so many years. So let us just take a moment of silence to remember Don and to send our thoughts and prayers to Carol and Donnie and his whole family. I also want to note that we've had some member attrition since our last meeting with Barry Goodman, Frank Leone, and Kathy Sullivan no longer serving on the DNC, and Johannes Abraham, who has resigned because of joining the Biden administration. I want to thank them for all the great work they've done with us over the time they uh, have spent with us on the DNC and here at the Rules and Bylaws Committee. And I know that we will continue, as you will see in just a little while, uh, to uh, call on their wisdom. Uh, uh, from time to time, even because actually once you are on the Rules by and Bylaws Committee, you may not be a formal member, but you are a member forever. 
It is now my honor to welcome my friend and the friend of this entire committee, our former chair, Tom Perez. As we all know, Tom took over the DNC at a time when, when it faced many challenges. Coming off the 2016 elections, hmm. we had a lot of rebuilding that we had to do, and Tom came in and worked tirelessly to get our party in a place where we were able to operate on all cylinders, in fact, turbocharged. As a result, under Tom's leadership, the DNC helped to win majorities in the House in 2018, organized in every zip code, strengthened our tech and data infrastructure, and supported the Biden campaign efforts in an unprecedented way. Democrats now have the White House and majorities in the House and Senate, and in many ways, this is because of the work of Tom Perez. Please join me and welcome Tom Perez in joining, uh, in joining us uh, for what some have characterized as his last official DNC event. Tom? Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair and Madam Chair. Uh, it's an honor to be with you. I was actually just in my office for only about the fourth time since March. It is time to uh, clean it up a little bit. And so I'm sorry I couldn't join you in person, but I, I have uh, another commitment right now that I am heading over to. And I wanted to start by uh, also paying uh, tribute to our good friend, Don Fowler. Uh, I still have a message on my voicemail from Don from about 10 days before he passed away. And uh, his message, as I think I said at the DNC meeting was, uh, put me to work. Uh, I, I want to make sure I can participate in the inauguration. And I know he was there in spirit to make history on January the 20th. I want to, I only want to take a few minutes here because you have important work to do. I really want to say thank you to all of you. Uh, remember where we were four years ago. We were, uh, we had a lot of work to do. Our, our, our mission then was to unite the party, to return power to the grassroots to make sure that everybody was heard. Uh, I, I have many of the headlines from the newspapers from that period, Democrats in disarray. Uh, we had some uh, major issues and I'm so grateful to my friend Donna Brazil who had stepped up uh, during that period. Um, Donna, you know, most people are trained to run away uh, from fire. Donna uh, has always run toward the fire in her distinguished career. And I'm very grateful as well to Leah Daughtry because uh, I remember the first day I entered the DNC, uh, Leah was there and really, really, really helpful uh, during that critical transition. And the Rules and Bylaws Committee uh, played uh, an indispensable role in our rebuilding of infrastructure and perhaps more importantly from the standpoint of the work of the Rules and Bylaws Committee, Rebuilding trust. The work you did was indispensable to that. I remember sitting in on one of the last meetings of the Unity Reform Commission. And if you had been beamed in from Mars in the meetings that were taking place toward the end, as well as meetings of the Rules and Bylaws Committee, uh, you would have had no idea by the end uh, who had voted for whom in 2016, because we were simply having a debate about our shared values how we get there, how we build a party that everybody can be proud of. And think about it, all that work you put in, uh, it really paid off, an unprecedented field of candidates in terms of numbers, and I would say quality as well. And we were able to get through the primary process uh, in remarkable ways, united as a party. Uh, look at uh, the participation in the democratic primary process. If we hadn't had the pandemic, as you well know, uh, we would have been simply celebrating uh, the record turnout throughout the democratic primary process. And that was because of your work. Uh, that was absolutely indispensable. So we have so much uh, to be grateful for at this moment. Uh, you have yesterday the announcement of uh, the purchase of uh, hundreds of millions of more vaccines. Uh, the, the president is going to exceed his goal of 100 million people vaccinated in 100 days, the first 100 days. Uh, dreamers have hope 
once again. Uh, the Recovery Act, uh, the, the $1.9 trillion uh, stimulus bill is going uh, to pass, and it's going to pass in short order. And, and that bill uh, is going to be transformational for people. Uh, we wouldn't have had that bill if we hadn't won Georgia. We wouldn't have had that bill if we hadn't won the presidency. We wouldn't have had that bill if we hadn't done all this work. So I hope we all reflect with great uh, pride at what we've been able to accomplish. We still have more work to do, and the role of the DNC uh, will continue to evolve as our needs evolve. But I am really, really grateful uh, to all of you. The, the, the countless hours that everybody uh, put in uh, really paid dividends. And I watch uh, as uh, the president and the vice president continue uh, to work methodically. I watch with great pride as my congressman, uh, Jamie Raskin, uh, presents a really compelling case in front of uh, the jury, if you will. Uh, I am so proud today uh, to be a Democrat. And frankly, I pray that uh, the Republican Party will find a soul someday because the party of Lincoln is clearly dead and it's been replaced by a very, very extreme party of Trump. We defeated Trump, but we sure haven't defeated Trumpism. And with your continued work, uh, we will continue uh, the great work of winning elections up and down the ballot, and now of making sure we communicate the successes of this remarkable administration. So thank you, uh, Madam Chair and Mr. Chair, for your uh, uh, incredible friendship over and leadership over the course of the last four years. Uh, this committee is a pillar of patience, uh, a font of wisdom, <laughs> and always uh, has remarkable uh, compassion. So uh, thank you again for everything that everybody has done. And uh, I am no longer chair, but I will always have the DNC in my heart. And uh, I look forward to continuing to work with you in various ways, shapes, informed. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair and Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, uh, on behalf of the Rules and Bylaws Committee uh, and, uh, and, and of all DNC members, thank you. Uh, we hope you get to enjoy, dare I say, the weekend. Uh, <laughs> and uh, we know that one thing that you have given us is uh, the uh, reminder to always remember what our North Star is. So uh, uh, know that whatever your moves are, you have left this party uh, in the best place, and we are grateful for your leadership. Thank you. Thank you so much. And it's been a pleasure to work with you uh, over these last four years. Now, Let's get to the business that, before, that is before us today. The main item of business at our meeting will be the consideration of the changes made to the West Virginia Democratic Party bylaws. The West Virginia Democratic Party conducted a, do, a review of its bylaws due to concerns raised in a number of challenges filed with the Rules and Bylaws Committee and the Convention Credentials Committee. Uh, concerning the state party's bylaws and the implementation of the state party's delegate selection process. This is the only actual item on our agenda today. We will soon be back in touch with all of you about scheduling our traditional post-cycle review of the presidential nomination. That review will include a review of the reforms made for the 2020 process as required by the unity resolution passed by the convention. When we have more information about the logistics for that, we will let you know. During this past spring and summer, the RBC and the Credentials Committee received several challenges to the West Virginia delegate selection process filed by Ms. Selena Vickers, who was here with us today. Ms. Vickers raised a number of issues related to how the delegate selection process was implemented and how the party operated more generally. After engaging with the state party and with Ms. Vickers, 
we entered into an agreement with the parties <clears throat> that would require the West Virginia Democratic Party, with the assistance of representatives from the Rules and Bylaws Committee, to review and reform the West Virginia Party bylaws to make sure that the state party's bylaws reflect the ideals of the Democratic Party and ensure the inclusion of West Virginia, West Virginia Democrats in all party affairs. The agreement focused on the following key areas, ensuring that the state executive committee and all state party bodies are equally divided, requiring the creation and implementation of an affirmative action plan and diversity outreach program to achieve representation as practicable in all party affairs by our core community groups and constituency groups, creating a diverse affirmative action committee to implement the affirmative action plan and diversity outreach plan, providing for at large positions on the state executive committee to ensure the representation of underrepresented groups in the state party's governing body, requiring county and state conventions to be conducted in compliance with state law and providing procedures for virtual meetings, defining when the state party executive committee is permitted to go into closed executive sessions and when meetings must be open to the public, and providing for timely and effective notice of all state party meetings, including committee and caucus meetings, and finally, defining full participation in party affairs. Lorraine and I asked two RBC members, Bishop Leah Daughtry and Frank Leon, to work with the state party to help them review their bylaws and make any necessary changes to ensure conformity with the DNC's charter and bylaws. Last year on December 10th, the West Virginia Democratic Party's Bylaws Committee held a meeting to review the party's bylaws and proposed amendments to ensure that it is operating in accordance with an open and transparent manner and that it is following the national party's rules. The only question before this Rules and Bylaws Committee today is to determine if the updated bylaws submitted by the West Virginia Democratic Party complies with the DNC's charter and bylaws. There are some challenges that were filed a couple of days after our agreement was reached by Ms. Vickers with the Credentials Committee of the DNC. They are pending with the Credentials Committee. They are not the subject uh, of today's meeting. They are a, a separate matter. Now I will call on Lorraine to go over the agenda and meeting protocols for today. Great. Thank you, Jim. Yeah. Members, in order to make sure our meeting runs smoothly, I want to go over the agenda and some quick protocols before we proceed. Before the Rules and Bylaws Committee begins to review and discuss the proposed updated bylaws, we will hear from both Ms. Selena Vickers, representing the challenging parties and West Virginia Democratic Party Chair, Belinda Bifor. I would like to take a moment to thank Chair Bifor and Ms. Vickers for their work to address the issues raised and, and to make changes to ensure that the West Virginia Party is addressing these important matters. Jim and I uh, have also asked um, Rules and Bylaws Committee representatives, Frank and Leah, to give an overview of their engagement and to provide their thoughts to the Rules and Bylaws Committee. Members, I, I just wanna say that we really do owe a debt of gratitude to uh, Leah and Frank for their untiring dedication to our party. And they really do represent uh, the Rules and Bylaws Committee admirably. And so we owe them a debt of gratitude to thank you. So thank them. I would like to note that earlier this week, Rules and Bylaws members received materials for the meeting that included the updated West Virginia Party bylaws, a memo from Frank and Leah, and a memo from 
Ms. Vickers. The last item of housekeeping is that rules and bylaws members and the guest speakers will automatically be muted throughout the meeting unless they are recognized to speak, at which point they will be introduced and unmuted by the staff. After the presentations, we will move to discussion. After the presentations, we will move to discussion, which will be limited to RBC members only. If a rules and bylaws member would like to be recognized for comments or questions, please use the raise your hand feature in Zoom. That will help us with staff assistance to create a queue that we'll use to call on each member. When it is your turn to speak, you will be announced and unmuted. We will do our best to call on everyone in the order that you seek recognition, but please, please be patient. Is there, are there any questions from any RBC me a member? Hearing, seeing none, then please submit your questions in the chat to Liz and we will address them for the group. Okay. Are there any questions? This is important that you fully understand our procedure today. Okay, hearing, seeing none. At this time, we will begin the presentations before we move to our discussion. If members have questions, we will take them after the presentations and before we move into debate about um, by the Rules and Bylaws Committee. Now, I will ask Ms. Vickers to share her thoughts on how she would like to see the bylaws change to address the issues she has raised. Ms. Vickers, we have 10 minutes allowed for you at this time. Our parliamentarian, Helen McFadden, will keep track of the time and will give you a one minute and 30 second warning if needed. Ms. Vickers, you may begin when you are ready. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chairs Miller and Roosevelt for the opportunity to share with this committee. Thank you to Reverend Daughtry and Mr. Leone and all of the DNC staff for their time and effort. I would also like to thank, hold on just one second, uh, thank Chair Biafor and the West Virginia Bylaws Committee for the progress made thus far. First, I would like to offer my condolences to this committee for the loss of Chair Fowler. I know that he will be greatly missed by this organization. I know that I will certainly miss learning from his experience and insights uh, delivered in that very charming Southern draw. Secondly, I know that this RBC um, configuration uh, will likely change this fall, and this may likely be my last opportunity to speak with you all. When I first started on this journey, I was completely, completely ignorant about party rules and party politics. And I can tell you that I like the rules part much, much better than the politics part. Um, you may not know it, but you have all been my teachers over the last several years, and I thank you. I have submitted proposed amendments. They are Exhibit B of the memo that I sent to you. Um, and that is my ask uh, that um, that those bylaws be um, um, be the bylaws that are accepted by this uh, committee. And I think that they meet uh, the spirit and the um, uh, the content of the charter and bylaws as well as the MOU. Our national charter was adopted in 1974, and it mandated that each state shall adopt and implement an affirmative action program which provides for participation as nearly as practical, a specific diversity groups, 
as their presence in a democratic electorate, I may refer to that as proportional representation. To the best of my knowledge, there is no evidence that the West Virginia State Party has ever adopted an affirmative action plan that is applicable to itself. In addition, there is no evidence that the party has conducted any effective outreach to diversity groups in nearly 50 years. To give you one example, to the best of my knowledge, um, the first African-American members of the West Virginia Dem Democratic Party didn't happen until last year. And then only after we had filed challenges about the lack of affirmative action and the lack of diversity. And to top it off, none to this day are voting members. The meeting where there were three African-American women added, the meeting where these women were added was any parliamentarian's example of how not to run a meeting and, and elect members. The bylaws were changed in the meeting without notice to create new positions and new members were elected on the spot. And the reason for the rush, the DNC team had sent them a staff evaluation three days before that meeting, informing them that because they were not equally divided, they would have to change how the PLEO and at-large delegates would be chosen. It could no longer be the executive committee. So they changed the bylaws to add more women immediately. And in the process, some of those women were uh, African-American. How is that for affirmative action outreach? How's that for full participation? How's that for transparency? And I have this, in case anybody doubts me, I have this meeting recorded and I'm glad to share that with you. The proposed amendments for the first time establish an affirmative action committee, an affirmative action plan applicable to the state committee. However, the proposed plan does not go far enough. It is critical, critical that the membership of the affirmative action committee be selected by the core diversity caucuses, the constituent, those groups, in order to ensure effective and full representation for, for full participation in all party affairs. In the grassroots most recent amendments that we've proposed, uh, we propose that each of the diversity caucuses of that core underrepresented groups elect two co-chairs and that those co-chairs be the members of the affirmative action committee. And there needs to be a mechanism to ensure that the implementation of the affirmative action plan with respect to diversifying the state committee. While I, I was given a very limited amount of time to, to present, and while I had hoped to detail all of our concerns um, from talking to, uh, that are outlined in the memo, um, from talking to many of you, I think that most of you agree that the issues that are detailed in the memo uh, have merit and agree with most of them. The barriers that people seem to share, um, it concerns about what is the jurisdiction of this body? How much can this body require a state party to do related to these issues? Therefore, I would like to remind you of a conversation that happened on July 30th, 2019. At that time, you all had just received uh, uh, Alabama uh, proposed bylaws. They had finally submitted a set of bylaws for this body to either accept or reject. I vividly remember Mr. Ickes giving his report. Um, the bylaws that Alabama presented allowed for some members of diversity groups to finally come on but the minority caucus which was controlled by dr reed insisted on electing all of the black members to those groups which would have been about 60 or 70 percent mr icky said the long and short of it is this is a power grab this is plain and simple this is not about race this is about power and now having ignored the diversity diversity groups decade after decade after def decade now that they are be they're coming into being dr greed wants to grab them he goes on to say our recommendation 
is that the revised final bylaws are unacceptable. They do not comply with the order and this committee should not approve, end quote. Ms. Lewis stated, and just to put a final point on everything that's been said, this is a result of two challenges. This is not something that we got up and decided to undertake, end quote. Mr. McDonald made the motion to reject the Alabama bylaws, and after Mr. Lou seconded it, Mr. McDonald explained his motion. He said, and I'll emphasize where he did, quote, our bylaws, and in particular, Article 2, Section 11B, which requires that the state party be functioning and have an affirmative action plan that is designed to encourage the participation of all Democrats in all party affairs, including nominating and selection of officers, not just some Democrats. And there's the question of intent that comes across when you say designed to encourage. And I'm just not persuaded by everything I've heard that the proposed bylaws from Alabama are designed to encourage the participation of all Democrats. Then Senator Martinez spoke in favor of the vote motion and the motion passed. No, there were some abstentions. No one opposed the motion. And importantly, after that vote, Chair Fowler, the greatest defender of state parties, made a point to seek recognition and state that he was for the motion. The West Virginia bylaws came to you today by way of six challenges, which upon the request of the DNC, the reformers withdrew in return for a written agreement, I have it nearby somewhere, a written agreement by this body and the West Virginia State Party. And it says in there, the agreement is to ensure that West Virginia's bylaws best reflect the ideals of the Democratic Party and ensure the inclusion of West Virginia Democrats in all party affairs. That's a much stronger mandate that all parties agreed to and signed on to than the credentials resolution related to Alabama. This body rejected the proposed bylaws of Alabama because you didn't approve of how they chose to select their diversity members. Their plan provided for proportional representation for each core constituency, but the glitch was that the minority caucus would control who they were. West Virginia is proposing adding a fraction of new members that won't get anywhere close to proportional representation. They initially suggested two members to meet diversity goals. Mr. Leone suggested six and they ran with that. And there's no clear understanding of who will choose the six. But I guarantee you that time is up. I have a sentence to finish. May I do that? Sure. I thought I'm sorry. I thought I had one minute warning. But I guarantee you this without clear guidelines, those six will be snatched up in the West Virginia version of a power grab after ignoring diversity groups for decade after decade after decade. Diversity groups will only have true representation in the party if they are offered the same courtesy that this committee demanded that Alabamans have. Thank you. I'm glad to take any questions that you may have. Our next speaker is, uh, before our discussion, uh, is the chairwoman of the West Virginia State Party, Ms. Belinda Beaufort. Chairwoman Beaufort, thank you for being here with us today and I thank you for your continued leadership on these important issues. You will have 10 minutes for your remarks um, with our time being monitored by Helen McFed. <coughs> Chair, Chair, Chair Beaufort, good to see you. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Nice to see you all. 
Thank you to the co-chairs and to the entire Rules and Bylaws Committee for taking time to discuss the work that the West Virginia Democratic Party is undertaking to make sure that we're operating in a manner that reflects our goal of openness, diversity, and inclusion. As many of you know, we've been looking at our state bylaws for many months to see how we could reform the way our party operates. We began this work last spring on updating the bylaws and it continued through our meeting on December 10th of last year. During this process, I have been committed to hearing from West Virginia Democrats and their ideas on how we can make changes to strengthen our party operations. Ms. Vickers and others have provided very thoughtful ideas and suggestions on how to improve our party processes. Many of their recommendations are included in the updated bylaws that were submitted to the RBC at the end of last year. I appreciate their engagement and look forward to continuing to work with Ms. Vickers and others as we work together to build and grow our party. I'm proud of the changes that are proposed in our updates and our bylaws. I know you have the updated bylaws in front of you, but I wanted to highlight some of the key changes that have been incorporated. The bylaws now provide for equal division of the state executive committee and our other party committees. I want to be clear that the language in the proposed bylaws is intended to ensure that all state party committees rules committees, affirmative action committee, and board of appeals, just to name a few, are equally divided. We have added language to better define when the executive committee can go into an executive session. The rules provide that a majority of members must agree that we go into session to discuss matters such as legal, personnel, discipline, strategy, or any other matters. As required by the national party rules, there are no secret ballots, and all votes will be held in an open and public meeting. We changed the notice provisions for our meeting and increased the timing of our notices from five to 14 days for meetings where officers are to be elected and meetings where bylaw changes are to be considered. We now provide a 30 day notice. One of the big areas we focused on is ensuring that these bylaws provide for a robust affirmative action and outreach program that will include the diverse constituencies that make up our Democratic Party. We updated our language to ensure we fully define what it means to have full participation in party affairs. We added provisions that provide for eight at-large diversity members to be added to the executive committee all three of our congressional districts will now have two at-large diversity members and the co-chairs of the affirmative, affirmative Action Committee will also be members of the State Executive Committee. These members will be elected by the Affirmative Action Committee and just to be clear, they will be voting members of the Executive Committee. I know there have been some questions about the status of our Affirmative Action Plan. We acknowledge that the existing plan needs some work and once these bylaws are approved, you have my full commitment that the Affirmative Action Committee will meet and develop a robust plan that incorporates the changes in the updated bylaws. As provided in the MOU, this work will be completed with two month, within two months of the state's party's adoption of the updated bylaws. It should be noted that while we focused on these updates to our bylaws, I have also been working to re-engage the key constituency groups that have not always been intimately involved in our state party. Just recently, I was in touch with the State Federation President of the NAACP to talk about ways to engage the African-American community. I spoke with our first African-American mayor in one of our biggest cities and a newly elected county chair. And I plan to talk to as many leaders and grassroots groups as possible in the coming days. I also want to make sure that the Affirmative Action Committee's membership is broadly representative of all our Democratic constituencies. While we know our affirmative action and outreach efforts are one, are one step to ensure representation on the Executive Committee, we will also work to expand our education and outreach efforts. We hold a Women's Summit and we plan to add other summits in the upcoming year. I'm committed to doing all that I can to make sure that the West Virginia Democratic Party 
is a place where all Democrats have a home and our executive committee membership reflects the diversity of our party. I am pleased to note that the proposed bylaws include updated provisions around how county and state conventions are conducted in order to better ensure their compliance with the state law and party rules. I have to take a moment to thank the DNC and the RBC for all of your help in this process. We are most fortunate to receive the guidance and support of two RBC representatives, Bishop Leah Daughtry and Frank Leone. Frank and Leah have been a invaluable resource to me and the bylaws committee. And I hope that I can continue to call on them for their guidance as we build on this important work. I truly believe we are on the right track and making changes to our party stronger and more inclusive. I know that we have more work to do and I'm committed to reporting back to the RBC after the state executive committee approves these updated bylaws and after we have implemented the new programs and finalized an updated affirmative action plan. So you will hear back from me about the pro progress that we have made with our new bylaws. I wanna thank you again for your time today. I hope that you will support the changes that uh, we have made so that we can get back to work engaging Democrats in West Virginia and working to elect Democrats all across our great state. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Biafor. I uh, appreciate your presentation. Uh, at this time, I would like to acknowledge uh, Frank Leone and Bishop Leah Daughtry, the RBC's representatives who worked with the West Virginia Party during this process. Frank and Leah jumped right on this project <coughs> and have been extremely helpful in navigating the work to make sure the West Virginia Party looked at their bylaws carefully and made any changes necessary to ensure the bylaws reflect the letter and the spirit of our DNC charter and bylaws. We have 10 minutes for this presentation and Helen will be monitoring the time. With that, the floor is yours, Frank and Leah. Hello, colleagues. Uh, see you all. We are looking forward to this conversation and Frank's going to go first with a review of the changes that we uh, made that we engaged in during this process. Frank? Yes, thank you. Great to see everybody. As, as uh, Chair Roosevelt mentioned, um, I, uh, I, after, after three terms on the DNC, I chose not to seek a fourth term. Not that there's anything wrong with seeking a fourth term, but uh, in any case, uh, so I, I thank you for the opportunity to, to come back and help with this project. Um, there, there are a couple of initial points I'd like to make. The, the first one is this is an unusual proceeding. As you recall, the Rules and Bylaws Committee uh, spends a lot of time closely reviewing each state's delegate selection plan. That, that's not the case with, with state uh, bylaws. Um, we don't have the same rule. And states typically have a wide discretion as to their bylaws as long as they don't violate the DNC charter and bylaws. Um, second, although the RBC's role today is limited to determining whether the West Virginia bylaws uh, comply with the DNC charter, the review process that got us here was, was much broader. Um, the, the challengers proposed a number of improvements to the West Virginia bylaws, many, many pages of improvements that were carefully reviewed by the state party. The state party, as Chair Biafor mentioned, has been looking at this process for nearly a year and had their own changes in the DNC uh, representatives also suggested some, some changes. Um, so you see a lot of red in the proposed bylaw amendments, but that, that doesn't mean the prior versions weren't in compliance. I think instead it means the West Virginia state party and the spirit of openness and cooperation uh, took advantage of the opportunity to update its bylaws. And, and frankly, that openness and cooperation is very, very different from what this committee saw uh, in Alabama. The review of the bylaws was guided by a memorandum of understanding that the West Virginia party, the challengers and the DNC RBC co-chairs entered into in July and um, it was our conclusion uh, that set forth in, in the memo that we circulated that West Virginia has complied with the terms of that uh, memorandum of understanding. 
they addressed the issues that were raised in there, starting with complying with equal division requirements for all of the state party entities, the, the executive committee and it's uh, the committees. They clarified provisions on state conventions. Um, they added language on virtual meetings, which probably a lot of state parties don't have that language yet, but, but could use. Um, they set forth uh, a requirement that meetings be open and provided specific examples of where it's appropriate to go into executive session. And they extended meeting notice requirements from five days to 14 or 30 days. Um, most importantly, the bylaws add a new diversity article, establish an affirmative action and outreach committee, add new eight, eight new voting members to increase diversity. And that's to, a, I believe it's a 68 member executive committee. So the addition of eight members is not insignificant. Um, and then that committee, uh, the affirmative action committee that is to be created will then draft a, a new uh, affirmative action and diversity outreach plan. So that of course, isn't the end of the process. Um, the committee will uh, draft that plan and, and frankly, I think that committee and that plan will address a number of the issues that the challengers raised in, in the memorandum they submitted prior to this meeting. Um, the challengers also submitted a draft uh, uh, affirmative action plan that they would like to see adopted, but it's really not the role of, of the DNC Rules and Bylaws Committee to provide a detailed affirmative action to a plan to a state party. It's, it's up to us to make sure that their bylaws comply with the DNC charter and then that affirmative action committee goes forward and adopts and implements its plan properly. And in doing so, I'm sure uh, they will consider the, the specific recommendations that, that the challengers have put forth, but it's, it's, it's really not a role to dictate every, every sentence of, of that program. It's up to the state party to implement it. So uh, the West Virginia uh, Democratic Party now needs to draft and implement its own plan as, as do um, 55 other state committees that have their own affirmative action programs. And um, I think uh, I would urge the Rules and Bylaws Committee uh, to approve the draft bylaws and also take into account the clarifications that uh, Ms. Biafor has made, which are on the record. Um, I, I don't think that the committee needs to, to spend time wordsmithing the, the bylaws. I think the, the yeah. intentions are quite clear. Thank you so much. Yes. Thank, thank you, Frank. Uh, I'm not sure how much time I have left, but I do want to um, say that Frank has very thoroughly gone through the changes that the West Virginia Party has made. I do want to underscore the cooperation of uh, Chair Biafor and the team at West Virginia DP. Uh, they have gone far beyond the requirements of the MOU, which were really to consider a set of circumstances. And they did much more than consider. They actually made substantive changes. And as we can testify from our multiple conversations, <laughs> emails, and countless Zoom with both Ms. Vickers and uh, the grassroots um, Democrats, as they call themselves, and Chair Biafor and her team, that we have really tried to engage all sides. And I think we wound up with a very good solution. Um, I do want to uh, say in terms of next steps, what we expect to have happen under the terms of the MOU, the uh, West Virginia Democratic Party has 30 days from the date of the RBC's action in order to adopt new bylaws uh, uh, for the state party. And during that time, should they uh, choose to adopt the bylaws that are substantially different from what we have approved today, they must return to the RBC for uh, approval of any substantive changes. Um, once the West Virginia party has adopted their new bylaws, they have 60 days from the date of the adoption to implement any changes that those new bylaws uh, require, such as and including building out the affirmative action committee, uh, uh, concretizing the affirmative action plan and developing any other outreach that needs to go mm -hmm. along with it. So I would just remind uh, our, our colleagues here on rules and bylaws and what our task is today 
under the terms of the MOU is simply to determine whether the new bylaws as passed by the bylaws committee of West Virginia DP on December 10th, are they in compliance? Do they comply with our national party charter and bylaws? That's really our task and really the only question before us. So uh, with that, Mr. Chairman, uh, I will conclude our section of the remarks and we look forward to questions. There we go. Okay. Uh, all right. Uh, thank you again to both uh, uh, Leah and Frank for all of the time and the effort that you've put into this important work. Uh, it's a great service to uh, the DNC and to this committee. I'm now going to turn this over to uh, my co-chair, Lorraine Miller, uh, for our discussion. Okay, there are no questions. Okay, we will now move to uh, a discussion on the proposed bylaws by the committee. The chair will entertain a motion to approve the updated bylaws as submitted by the West Virginia Democratic Party in accordance with the memorandum of understanding between the Rules and Bylaws Committee the West Virginia Party and Ms. Vickers. Just a reminder that Rules and Bylaws Committee members should please use the raise your hand feature in Zoom to be recognized. You will be called on and unmuted when it is your turn to speak. The chair now recognizes uh, Ms. Susan Swiker for a motion. Thank, thank you, um, Madam Chair, and I appreciate everybody's hard work and effort on on this. It's a very thorough, um, thorough, detailed plan and a very thorough report. And um, and so I would just like to make the following motion. Whereas the West Virginia Bylaws Committee conducted a comprehensive review of the bylaws and whereas the state party and the bylaws committee considered and proposed changes in the key areas required by the MOU to ensure the West Virginia Democratic Party is more diverse and inclusive. And whereas the West Virginia Bylaws Committee discussed and considered additional views and proposals and have incorporated the spirit of those views in the document being reviewed by the Rules and Bylaws Committee today, I therefore move that the Rules and Bylaws Committee approve the proposed bylaws as presented and recommend approval and implementation of these by the state party in accordance with the agreement. Is there a second? This is Jason Ray, I second Ms. Wrecker's motion. Thank you. We will, thank you, um, Secretary Ray. We'll now move into a discussion of the motion. So members, you know that you need to raise your hand uh, to be recognized. Madam Co-Chair, next we will hear from David McDonald. Uh, thank you, uh, Liz. I actually had a couple of questions for the um, presenters, uh, and I wasn't quite clear, I guess, on the process for when we were supposed to raise those questions and the mechanism. But uh, it's also relevant to the motion. The, the motion impliedly asks us to certify that the memorandum of understanding was followed that the process um, you know, was carried out, that consideration was given. Um, and so I had a couple of questions uh, just about the process um, to make sure that it was. Um, one of them um, is I noticed that the uh, review committee, if I read the memorandum of, of uh, understanding correctly, the review committee was supposed to include um, to the, uh, a fair reflection. It's not an absolute requirement of the various groups listed in uh, section BB of the um, Memorandum of Understanding, one of which was the Native American population. And in looking at the minutes of the uh, Bylaws Review Committee, I didn't see uh, anybody who was evidently a member of the Native American community. 
I suspect that the Native American community is a relatively small percentage of the population in West Virginia, but I did um, want to at least note for the record, I didn't see it. And if there's a reason um, why that occurred, just give um, the West Virginia party a chance to um, answer. And then uh, a second question I had has to do with the affirmative action committee that is going to be created under the bylaws. Um, when I look at the bylaws that are proposed, they indicate that the affirmative action committee that is created will have representation from the diversity groups that are in the current affirmative action plan. I don't know if I've seen the current affirmative action plan, but I did see um, a document submitted by Ms. Vickers, which um, may be the current affirmative action plan. And if it is, um, the diversity groups that are mentioned in that document um, are only about half of the diversity groups that are in our charter. Right. And it sort of seemed to me that the spirit of the uh, MOU that resolves the challenges oh. would mm -hmm. require that we at least ask why the rest of the groups, excuse me, not why, because they may well be included, ask if all of those groups uh, will uh, be reached out to in the process of developing the affirmative action plan. Um, and if not, then why not? Those were my questions. Thank you. Can we ask Chairwoman Beaufort? Ms. Yeah. Beaufort, can you, yeah. could you respond? Um, absolutely. Um, I'm not sure what group that you're referring to, but I'll certainly go back and look. We thought we had every group covered, but absolutely, if not, we'll take another look at that and make sure that they are reached out to. Uh, it was the Native American uh, uh, demographic. So. Okay, uh, yeah. we'll take a look at that. Absolutely. Okay. All right. Our, I think our next speaker is Mr. Ickes. Am I unmuted? There you are, Harold. Oh, okay. I I I have several parts that I want to question is it is it better given this system which I'm not all that facile with to ask everything at once or do you want me to come back in after others have spoken as well why well, can we do it let's do it all at once and then we just see where we'll parcel out who needs to respond okay so step several points I wanted to make. Um, uh, Chairwoman referred to the equal division uh, as including all committees and uh, subcommittees, etc. When you read the proposed language that she submitted, it is, wait just a moment, it's Article 4, Section A, Subsection 2 on page 6. It reads, state executive committee and other state committee members shall be as equally divided as practicable. It's, it's a nonsensical phrase. What does the phrase and other state committee members mean? The executive, the executive committee are the state committee members. There's no reference in here to any other committees. And the phrase and other state committee members um, meaning that eludes me. So that's point one. Point two, in the same article, subsection B on page six, open meetings. Uh, as, uh, as Ms. Vickers has made clear in a number of her challenges and in memoranda, the uh, state committee increasingly meets in members only meetings, sometimes for often as long as the open members meeting. So the typical um, situation is that the state committee will is noticed for a meeting. Uh, they then meet in closed session, members only, um, no outsiders, no non-members permitted, and often for an hour or so to be followed by an open meeting in which there are, and I've listened to some of the transcripts, there are very brief discussions and the votes are taken. The, 
I know that Mr. Vickers is very concerned about the increasing use of open meat. And the way this provision is drafted, it is as open-ended as a Mississippi River. It says all meetings of the executive committee and other party committees shall be open to the public. Then it goes on to say committees, here, here, here's the kicker. Committees, however, by majority vote, present in voting, may go into executive members only session to discuss legal, personnel, discipline, and strategy or other matters. There is no limit there. It's one thing uh, Ms. Vickers has said uh, in her memos that, you know, there, there ought to be times when a party committee vote can go into executive session to discuss sensitive uh, confidential matters. And I know that those phrases, sensitive and confidential, are quite elastic from a lawyer's point of view. But this section B uh, includes no limits whatsoever. And when you look at Article, uh, let me find it here. Article 9, Section 12 of the Charter, of our party charter, it says all meetings, there's no qualification there, it says the word all meetings of the Democratic National Committee, comma, the Executive Committee, and all other party committees, commissions, and bodies shall be open to the public and vote shall not be taken by secret ballot, et cetera, or use of the unit rule. So the charter includes no exception. The charter includes no exception for uh, sensitive matters uh, that probably ought to be discussed in, in close quarters. So if, you went, if you're saying that this proposal by the chairwoman complies with the charter, it's a complete, it, there's no relationship between her proposal and the mandate of the charter. My view is that there are times they should be very selective when a party committee needs to have an executive members only meeting. And I think our budget committee on the DNC has that. But so that that's point two. Um, in terms of the whole affirmative action construct, uh, the, the real vagueness on Article 8, new Article 8 uh, of Chairwoman Beaufort's um, amendments, and they really need to be clarified. I agree with Frank and, uh, and Leah that the RB, first of all, let me step back a minute. It is clear when you read the charter that the DNC has very, very broad authority over state parties. Should it exercise that authority judiciously? The answer is yes. And should the state parties have a lot of latitude? The answer is yes. But this state party, especially with, re with respect to uh, affirmative action and diversifying its committee has for nearly 50 years avoided having a affirmative action committee, has avoided having an affirmative action plan. And it was not until Vickers and her 60, 70 colleagues filed multiple challenges that the first blacks were added to the committee. If you look at the representation based on democratic electorate, there should be six. Three have been added, and all three are in non-voting positions. If you look at youth, and youth was in the original uh, provision of Article of Article 10, which was later amended and renumbered to be Article 8, youth was in there. The phrase minorities was used. Blacks were not in that one, although I think it's clear that uh, it was intended that minorities cover blacks and African Americans, but youth has been in there from the get-go. And when you look at the uh, when you look at the uh, uh, state committee membership today, um, based on the Democratic electorate, there should be 24 youth. There are 10 youth 
but of those 10, only six are voting members. So you can't, you know, it's, it's it, it, I think that the facts alone indicate how resistant this state committee has been for nearly 50 years for inclusion and therefore there needs to be, in my view, some additional changes, amendments made to the Article 8. Uh, again, I agree with Frank and, and, and Leah. The RBC has the power to, if you read all the provisions of the Charter, there is clearly power in the RBC and the Democratic National Committee to, uh, to, to uh, impose or persuade state parties to make real changes where they're needed. So I agree with Frank and, and, and uh, Leo. The state committee should be permitted to have its affirmative action committee come up with an affirmative action plan, and maybe they will come up with a proposal that's different from the one that Ms. Vickers has pushed, which is uh, having the caucuses, the diversity caucuses nominate diversity members and to be elected by the state committee. And they should have that opportunity. But I think we have to under, we have to make sure that that affirmative action committee is not going to be appointed by the state chair. That that affirmative act, the membership of that committee needs to come from the grassroots caucuses who will elect their co-chairs and, and those co-chairs under Vickers' proposal should be, the, uh, should be the members of the Affirmative Action Committee. But, you know, this, this party, just based on the facts alone, has been in violation of key elements. There, there's hardly anything other than for affirmative action there's hardly anything more sacrosanct in the party than diversification and giving, I don't even like the word minority, but giving diversity constituencies the ability to participate in a real meaningful way in the party councils. That's, that's Article 8, Section 3. It comes down from old Article 10, et cetera. And there are many other, there are other provisions. And uh, 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 David referred to... Uh, Article 2, Section 11 of the bylaws, which is in many ways similar. So I think the Article 8 needs to be amended. The meeting provision needs to be amended. It is just like it makes the Mississippi River look like a little old dry creek. And the, uh, and the affirmative action uh, needs to be changed. Or, I'm sorry, the equal equal division provision needs to be changed because it's nonsensical as written. I'm finished. Well, thank you. okay. Ms. Dickies, thank you. You, you raised some uh, interesting issues. So can we, I'd like to recognize uh, Mr. Leon, Frank Leon, and then Chair Beaufort um, to, for some additional uh, remarks. Mr. Leon. Yes, thank you. Thank, thank you, Mr. Eckes. I think, I think maybe with uh, Chairman Fowler's passing, you're probably the longest uh, person, the longest institutional memory on this committee, and always appreciate your, 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 your thoughts. Um, to respond to your three points, first of all, in terms of equal division, that sentence could be more artfully written. And, and when the state party adopts these changes, because remember, they've, they've, the bylaws committee has drafted these bylaws where to approve them, and then it goes to the state party. Um, that I, if they want to take a closer look at that and, and fix it, the intent was that equal division apply to all state bodies: the state executive committee, the appeals board, the affirmative action committee, the resolutions committee, everything else. On on executive session, yes, the the DNC charter does say meetings are supposed to be open. The DNC charter also says the DNC is governed by Roberts rules. Roberts rules provides for executive session and doesn't provide any limitations on executive session. And the DNC and this body certainly go into executive session on, on many occasions. So what we've tried to do here is add an, an open meetings requirement, add an executive session with some criteria 
But I don't think there is a state party in the country, and certainly not the DNC, that has super limited executive session powers. Sometimes you have to do it for personnel reasons. You have to do it for legal reasons. You yourself mentioned budget. Sometimes they're, they're just simple strategy meetings. You don't want the press and the Republican Party to see what you're, whose seats you're planning on targeting. So, you know, I, I know Ms. Vickers believes this has been abused in the past. It shouldn't be. It shouldn't be abused by a party. And so we've tried to provide some guidelines, but I don't think the DNC charter requires anything more specific. And on affirmative action, I think, I think we do agree. Um, maybe maybe uh, Bishop Darty has, has other thoughts, but it sounds like we're both on the same page of letting the West Virginia uh, State Party implement, uh, come up with, a, establish an affirmative action committee, come up with a plan and implement that plan, subject to you know, future concerns that, that, that may be raised. But I, I don't think that, that this committee needs to rewrite the bylaws right now. I think, I think we, can, we can let the state party go with uh, what they've set out. Thanks. Ms. Beaufort? Uh, yeah, I just want to say one thing. If you look at our bylaws that are being proposed, it does include African Americans and Native Americans on page 19. So Native is in there. I just wanted to clarify that. And, um, and as far as what Frank said about equal division, absolutely, we can reword it, but that's uh, just what we meant. As far as our open meeting concerns, um, this wasn't something that we did a lot of in the past, but since I've been chair, we've had a, an issue with it because people felt the need to come and record and broadcast on social media everything that was going on in that meeting. There were uh, one particular meeting when the House and Senate members came in to specifically talk about uh, recruitment and talk about some polling issues and somebody tapped on my shoulder and said, you better shut them up because we're being Facebook Live. So that uh, brought us to the point where we had to uh, move to uh, closed meetings. We've never taken a vote in those, but we had had some deep discussion. And there are times when some of our members didn't feel comfortable uh, making comments being broadcast on Facebook. So we, uh, we started having some uh, members only meetings um, I got the idea from attending DNC meetings and ASDC meetings. We have them um, about every meeting that I went to. We don't abuse it. It is simply used basically for strategy and personnel issues more than anything else. So I hope that helps answer your questions. Thank you, Chair Bill, for um, uh, Chair Dordry. Yes, ma'am. I, I do want to um, just address the spirit of, of the affirmative action uh, uh, issues that Harold has raised. And I, of course, am very sympathetic and certainly understand the history, uh, which has been an evidence of the West Virginia party and how it has included a failed to do necessary outreach to uh, broad uh, demographics of the Democratic Party. I think that could probably say be said for many state parties. However, I do want to um, give benefit of the doubt to the leadership of the West Virginia Democratic Party and the cooperation that they have shown uh, along and again this could be said of many of our state parties to try to change behavior from what has happened in the past and I would like to uh, give them the benefit of the doubt give Chair Bia Ford and her team the benefit of the doubt based if only based on what we have seen over the past six months or so in terms of cooperation in terms of their intent and desire to open up the party um, to to more people. Um, and I want to and, I, and I'm trying to view this in the lens of what we do here may have mm -hmm. accountability for other state parties at other times and what are we willing to do and how far are we willing to go uh, with not just this situation, but what will become a uh, watermark for others. And I want to uh, err on the side of looking at current leadership and what their current commitment is and what their demonstrated capacity and desire is to do something different and not rely on what happened before they were in leadership. I think that, uh, that that's where I'd like to err. And I think I would like uh, our colleagues to consider erring in that way also and not ho holding current leadership accountable 
for what past chairs and past times may have done, but what can, how can we move forward from here? Great. Thank you, Reverend Daughtry. Um, Mr. Zodi? Um, are you seeing, yeah. Okay, I'm unmuted, I think. Thank you, Madam Co-Chair. My questions are just some, just clarifying. I think one of them was sort of a tangential one to Harold's question, but on um, in Article 8 on Section A, uh, under Section A in the third paragraph, I just want to clarify how the co-chairs are being elected. I just, the, the paragraph was, um, I guess, confusing to me. I don't have a uh, dog in the fight one way or the other on this, but I just wasn't sure. The co it says two co-chairs of different genders shall be elected by the members of the Affirmative Action Committee at its first meeting, follow the organizational meeting. Then there are to be no more than one co-chair from the same constituency organization. And this is the co-chair shall be elected by the state executive committee at the organizational meeting to terms of four years. So are there two different sets of co-chairs that's referring to, or is it the same set of co-chairs? I guess I was confused about how they were, who was choosing them on there when I read this, the paragraph. Does that make sense? Chair before, or would you? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yes, actually, the uh, the committee themselves will pick the co-chairs from among each group. Okay. So that that's who will select the co-chairs in addition to the two from each congressional district. So are those are, are the two from each congressional districts the one that the, are they're selected by the state committee then? No, they'll be they will be um, elected from their group. Okay. From from their groups. So then who are the co-chairs elected by the state committee? That's then um, that they will be the co-chairs of the actual affirmative action committee. Okay, so the co-chairs of the affirmative action committee are selected by the state committee. Is that what you're saying? Well, I think what had happened was that was our original intent. And then we went back through and talked about adding the uh, two per congressional, mm -hmm. which made a total of eight. So actually they'll all be elected by the affirmative action committee, including the two co-chairs. So maybe I need to uh, make a note to clarify that, but it will come from the committee itself. Gotcha, so is any argument that, co-chairs? I'm sorry, Belinda, go ahead. No, no, I was just gonna say that they'll, they'll be sent to the executive committee to be. Okay, so is that last sentence in there uh, superfluous? Yes. It is okay. All right. So there's no no co-chairs elected by the state executive committee. There's not. Okay. So that maybe should be deleted. If that's probably yes. Okay. All right. Cool. I just wanted to. It just seemed to contradict itself a little bit. And then this is probably is it the intent then of the affirmative action plan? So we've got the bylaws that we have to decide whether they comport with the charter. And then the once the affirmative action plan is drawn up and implemented, will that contain information then on how a constituency group would be uh, permitted or certified to join the state committee? Is that where that process is gonna be laid out? Is yeah, I mean, we have an affirmative action plan right now. We have caucuses yes. for each of the breakdowns. Um, right now, some are more active than others yeah. and they each have their own policy, but what we wanna do is strengthen that. We wanna make it even better we want to make it more inclusive, and that's probably something that that really is going to need work on. It's not that we don't have one; it's that we want to make it better. Okay, so then the the, the process for how someone like a, a constituency caucus, how they join the uh, become voting members, I guess, of the committee is is that that's where the the affirmative action plan is where that's laid out. Is that's that correct. Right? Okay, that's gotcha. correct. That's what I needed. Thanks, Melinda. Appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Right. That's, that's that's the end of my questions, uh, Madam Co Chair. Thank you, Mr. Zodi. Good right. to see you. you too. We have uh, in the queue Jeff, Artie, and Yvette, and we'd we'll like to take them in that order. And then we have another three or so after that. But Jeff, Artie, and Yvette. Okay. Uh, thank you. Can you hear me? Got you, Jeff. All right. Great. Uh, first, uh, I wanted to say that uh, that was really an excellent presentation by the state party to capture the scope of the changes that you're making. And um, I think we all really appreciate it. I think we also need to commend uh, 
Selena and those that, you know, helped bring these issues to the fore. And of course, Frank and Leah for helping guide everyone through this process. Um, the questions that I had have somewhat been touched on mostly. I just will have two points uh, that are structural that I wanted to raise for uh, clarification. And, and John just went over part of it. It's a little unclear to me exactly how the initial affirmative action committee is stood up. But I, I do think the chair said that the selections for the affirmative action committee will be made by the caucuses of uh, those diversity caucuses within the party. And if she could uh, confirm that, that I think is really important that the caucuses have their own voice mm. in helping establish the affirmative action committee. Uh, the second point that I wanted to make uh, had to do with the new at large positions. And my understanding is there will be eight new positions, which are the six at large, plus the two co-chairs of the affirmative action committee. Those eight will be members of the new, of the state executive committee. And I just wanted to confirm, it wasn't clear to me that they're voting members, that they have, that they're on par with the vast majority of the state executive committee, because I know there are some non-voting positions. I don't know why they're non-voting and I'm not asking for any of the details, but just that these new positions that are being put in for diversity purposes will be voting positions uh, going forward. So those are my two clarifications. Uh, but I again, I wanna thank the chair for the presentation. Go ahead. Thank you, yeah. Yes, yeah. 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 thank you. Thank you. And um, yes, you're absolutely right that the co-chairs will be picked from the caucus in addition to the, um, the, the two that represents the congressional districts um, making up the eight at large. And yes, they are all voting positions. And one other thing that hasn't been mentioned, we actually have eight elected members uh, in addition to the eight we're adding for a total of 16 on that committee. So, you know, there were some minorities, some groups that have already been elected and on there that are voting. So I just thought that was important as well. But, but yes, to clarify, they will be voting members and there are eight new uh, at-large positions to add. Right, and, and then, the, uh, then the, the first question was that the initial affirmative action committee that those members are uh, that there is input from the caucuses themselves, the diversity caucuses, as to the selection of who is on the affirmative action committee itself. That's correct. There will be. Yes. Thank you. Yes, sir. Okay. okay. Artie. Right, thank you, Madam Chair, Madam Co-Chair. Um, my question is in regards to the same article, article eight diversity section A, and in the second paragraph uh, states that the affirmative action committee will shall consist of members of each democratic constituency organizations. So my question was what organizations currently exist? Um, and in one of the exhibits from Ms. Vickers included an affirmative action plan, outreach plan from the party, uh, I believe last year and possibly July 2020 in last year. And where there is, I just want clarification, I guess, because what is in that plan that I've seen um, is a women's caucus, a young Democrats caucus, a black caucus, individuals with disability, LGBTQ. And then there are others that do not include so there are three that are missing and i kind of wanted to get an update from you maybe at the time uh you haven't created these organizations but where native american latino and aapi is missing and maybe if 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 there is already currently a plan in uh getting these organizations up and in your mind moving forward what is the plan of the party to create or work with to identify to create these organizations in the timeline. I just want to get a sense that what is 
hopefully the plan moving forward around what your democratic constituency organizations are that will be part of this committee. Yeah, the, the document that you were looking at and the ones that you um, talked about are the current plan that we have. What we're doing now is building and making that plan better which will include the Native Americans, the AAPIs, and anybody that's missing that we just added to our diversity section. So yes, those will be represented. Um, we already have a few um, other than the Native American on our committee that have agreed to work and help develop the policy to make that go forward once we get the approval on this. Okay, and then one last clarification question if I, if I may is, once the, what I think I heard on the timeline that once the final rules and bylaws with any potential amendments from some of the recommendations that I think some of my colleagues on the committee has already given, that there is 60 days to begin the implementation of the affirmative action outreach plan. I just wanted to make sure I had that correct. Um, that's my understanding. Yes, we are, you know, we're, we've been working on it all along, but didn't go complete with it until we got the approval on our bylaws and, and moved forward. So. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Carol. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, well, I want to make a motion. I'm not sure it's obvious. It's not appropriate to make the motion now uh, about the jurisdiction of the Rules and Bylaws Committee going forward. But coming back again to the uh, uh, meeting provision, I hear what Frank said about Robert Rules of Order. But when you look at the broad language of seven of Article. 9 section 12 says all meetings of the Democratic National Committee. There's no qualification there. And then if you look at section 14, it says in the absence of other provisions, Robert rules of order most recently shall govern. Well, there's no absence of a provision here. There's a very clear um, provision in section <laughs> two. So again, Helen, you and, and the co-chairs obviously and Helen need to uh, guide how you, I would, I want to make a motion to amend the existing meetings provision in Chair Beafor's uh, version to add the word confidential. I, put, I, I understand that uh, that can be in the hands of any lawyer quite elastic, but it seems to me at least it puts up a guardrail. It sets sort of a norm. Uh, in the context of that current provision, that current proposed amendment, which is completely wide open uh, on the affirmative action situation. And so you, you, I just need guides about how I would like to make that as a motion, but I'll leave it to the co-chairs and Helen to well, figure out how to make it. Carol, um, yes. I, I wanted to, to include Jim. I'd like to see if Helen, our, our parliamentarian, could make a ruling because we do have a motion on the floor here. So no, I understand. That's why I'm deferring to you all. Okay. Um, I defer to you all. Um, Jim, what do you, and Helen? Um, Madam Chairman, the, the motion that is under consideration <clears throat> is the motion from Ms. Schwecker, right. which, which in compliance with the MOU, was to approve the bylaws as presented as consistent with the required the effect of the MOU. Mr. Icky's motion is a direct amendment to the bylaws. So it's it's not an amendment to the pending motion. It's not an amendment to the Schwecker motion, which is what is under consideration. What Mr. Icky's just articulated is a direct amendment to the proposed bylaws. Well, 
And and I thought we were under the pen if if the and maybe I'm I misunderstood. I thought if the committee supported this, if when Chairman B4 goes back to her um, committee and they decide that they wanted to make some changes, they would have to come back to us again. So any substantive changes. So can can we um, Frank? Can you speak to this real quick? Frank or Leah or. Yes, I'm sorry. I, it, it, it took it took me a minute to get unmuted. Okay. Yeah, I look. I, I call her back. Yeah, I've I've um, I've I've spent yeah, more time with all this than, than the rest of you have, and I think you know a way to move this forward would be to simply ask uh, Chair Biafor if she would be okay in adding the word confidential to the uh, reasons why you go into executive session and. If she agrees to do that, then I don't. I don't think the committee needs to take any action. I think the the comments that she has made um, that are part of the record, and and uh, I think we can anticipate that they would be they would be implemented. So that's that that's what I would do is is perhaps ask the chair if she's okay with adding the word confidential, and then we can be done. Okay. Before we do that, I, I just want to make sure, uh, Reverend Dorcher, did you have a comment? <laughs> Uh, just a tech technical issue. Um, since the bylaws committee of West Virginia Democratic Party has already approved this bylaws, it seems mm. to me, based on what Frank is saying, that that Chair Biafor would be asking the bylaws committee to consider an amendment to what they are proposing. I don't I don't know that she can just change it, but I think she can mm. uh, ask the bylaws committee to uh, to take a vote themselves to change that before it's presented to the full West Virginia Democratic Party. Sure, yeah, that, that would work. I mean, another way to view it is, is, is it's not substantive, but but yes, I think technically there, there have been a few things we've talked about, about clarifying the language, correcting something here and there. And, and yeah, I think submitting all that back to the bylaws committee just to have them look at those changes. And I don't think under the memorandum of understanding that any of that needs to come back to to, to the rules and bylaws, uh, I, I think we're all we're we're all comfortable with uh, with with those the changes that we've talked about, and in fact the changes that we've suggested that this committee has suggested to, to chair Bia for. So, Matt, if I may, um, Chair Miller, uh, yes, sure. ask um, uh, Chair Bia for would she be amenable to uh, presenting that uh, addition of the word confidential in terms of uh, the meeting notice? Is she amenable to that language? You took the words from my mouth. Great. Okay. Thank you, madam. Yeah, no. Yeah, yeah, yes, yes, I would. And I will take that to the bylaw committee and uh, with that suggestion. So, yes. Okay, great. Mr. Yes, sir. I'm ready to make a couple other points when you're ready. Okay, please. Okay. It, it seems to me, I, 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 I heard, uh, I heard Leah loud and clear that, you know, the current state committee and the current state chair shouldn't be burdened with what happened in the past. I would point out in that regard that it's my understanding that uh, Chair Beaufort has been chair since 2015. And it took, and during that, her tenure there, the charter, especially with respect to affirmative action, was completely ignored. Number two, it seems to me that Chair Beaufort is implying that they in fact have an affirmative action plan that has been adopted by what body she hasn't said. And my understanding is that there is no record of that affirmative action plan. First of all, she submitted two, as you probably know. She submitted one in July of 2018, and then she submitted a second as a uh, as an exhibit to her answer to a challenge. So it's unclear what affirmative action plan Chair Beaufort is referring to, number one. Number two is uh, the affirmative action plan itself, if you look at the amendments proposed by Ms. Vickers, is very, very deficient and does not meet. If that's the affirmative action plan that the chair is talking about, need some 
very serious amendment if it's going to meet the uh, provisions of the charter and the bylaws. So, and then finally, I would say that there are a number of changes that I think have been discussed and seemingly agreed to with respect to the affirmative acts or, or, or Article 8 of the proposed amendments. But it strikes me that before this RBC approves the changes, that those changes ought to be presented in writing so that we know that what we're approving. I quite frankly, I guess I was just asleep at the quick. I didn't understand Ms. Schwecker's motion to mean that we couldn't amend the that the bylaws couldn't be amended. But surely we, the RBC, can suggest amendments before we approve. So I would urge that until the appropriate amendments have been made, and particularly that have been talked about, particularly to Article 8, that this committee not approve until Ms. Biafor, Chair Biafor, comes back with language that we can all see. You know, this, this committee, this state committee has been dragged kicking and screaming into uh, complying with the charter. This is not something, this is no kumbaya that occurred. This was kicking and screaming after six, seven uh, challenges had been filed. So I would urge that this committee not approve until Chair Biafor come back with uh, a language that she is taking from this meeting. Um, I'm finished. Thank okay. You. Um, Leah or Frank, do you have any, since, since you worked with them, do you have any comments that you wanted to offer to Mr. Speaky's <laughs> remarks? And Chairman Beerful, we'll go to you just to, let's, let's see what Mr., um, what Frank and Leah have well, to say. I'll, 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 I'll go first and then let Frank, um, <laughs> Frank finish up. I, I, you know, I don't know about the kicking and screaming part, Harold, because I haven't seen that. What I've seen over the last six months in terms of working with West Virginia Democratic Party and Chair Biafor has been a very cooperative uh, uh, relationship, uh, cooperative conversations with both Ms. Vickers and Chair Biafor. So I don't, I can't testify uh, or say amen to the kicking and screaming part because that has not been my experience. Um, I think what we are proposing here, as I understand it, is that the Affirmative Action Committee of the West Virginia Democratic Party create their Affirmative Action Plan. And I think that kind of autonomy and self-determination is appropriate in this moment. We, we are, uh, they're going to have a committee. That committee should be tasked and trusted to create an affirmative action plan that is suitable for the state in which they live. And then if it needs to come back to us, if there's wants to be if someone wants to challenge that, they can challenge that. But I really want to uh, let the agency of what that plan looks like rest with the people of West Virginia who are on that committee, that is their job, that is the task that we are giving them. And I'd like to uh, trust them to do that job and to create that plan, which will then go to the state executive committee for approval. But I think that is really, it is not our job to, to create state's affirmative action plans. We, at least not in the time that I've been on the rules committee, we can review mm -hmm. them after the plans are done. That's what we do with delegate selection. I don't know why we do something different here. So I'm looking forward to uh, the folks who will be appointed and the plan that they come up with, which will probably be more appropriate than anything we non-West Virginians will come up with in terms of outreach. Great. Mr. Leon? Yeah, uh, what, what Reverend Art already said. And, and also, so I, the motion before is to approve the bylaws as amended as being in compliance with the, with the charter and bylaws. And, and I, I think a, an affirmative vote on that is, is appropriate. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, we'll move now to David. David, do you have um, a question or, or remarks? There you are. I'm sorry. Okay, now I'm unmuted. Thank you. Uh, actually, it's not a question. Um, and to some extent, Leah has just um, 
said much of what I wanted to say, but I, this is my understanding of the process that, that um, they are to create an affirmative action plan that cre that's drafted by an affirmative action committee that is more representative, um, a plan that we have not yet seen, but that we necessarily will review no matter what happens today, no matter what vote we take today, we will necessarily review when they submitted the delegate selection plan to us in 2023. Um, I've never known this committee to simply take at face value um, a statement in the delegate selection plan that affirmative action will be taken care of. I mean, we tend to get into those things. So I, I, I'm personally comfortable uh, approving these today, knowing that we will see them again. And I'm also perfectly comfortable with all of us expressing concerns that we have about the affirmative action situation we've seen so that the state party has an opportunity to uh, consider those when it drafts its plan. You know, I, I, I think it's fair to note that West Virginia has um, a demographic that is not the same as every other state yeah. in terms of its representation of uh, underrepresented groups and overrepresentation of groups that have plenty of representation already. But be that as it may, that's, that's my piece. Great, thank you. Ms. Lewis, Yvette Lewis. Thank you. Um, I just uh, kind of want to second all of these emotions. Um, as a state party chair, um, I know that there are different concerns for each state. Um, that what uh, I've, I've been listening for is moving forward. Are they uh, implementing what needs to be done? It sounds like they are uh, moving forward. Just listening to the remarks of Chair Beer for today, everything that we have suggested to her, I'm hearing, I will take that back. Yes, I am willing to do. Now I heard Alabama mention, that's the definition of kicking and screaming. This, to me, this is not the definition of kicking and screaming. And for those of you that went through Alabama with us, you know that that is. But I will say that um, from what I'm hearing, first of all, West Virginia had the mechanisms in place to do what needed to be done. The state that I worked on didn't, and that was part of the problem. I think that uh, we do need to give people the benefit of the doubt. We also need to give people uh, the, the benefit of the doubt uh, and consider their geography, consider where they are and how they are able to include people. If, if, the, if the demographic is not there, the demographic is difficult to put in place. So we have to trust that everything that will be done to include as much of the demographics and as many of the people that need to be included in this process, we need to allow them the, the, uh, the space to do that. Um, so I don't see anything in here that says to me, I need to vote against what I'm hearing. I'm, I'm keeping an open mind at this point, but at this point, I have not heard anything that says we should not move forward. I trust Leah, I trust Frank, I know the work that they put in it, and I also know the work that goes into this because I've done it. And if they've come back to us with this type of report, it is because they have spent hours and, and hours, emails, phone calls, Zooms, everything, and everything has been considered. So I think we should give the state party uh, the space to come back to us, to go back to, to, to their people. The chair needs to go back to her, her, her party, come back to us if necessary. But, but as, a, as a state party chair, I appreciate everything that, that has to be done when you go back to your state after you leave this body. And I think we need to, to allow her to go back to her state after she leaves this body, so. Thank you, Ms. Lewis. We'll now hear from Artie and then we'll uh, go to Ms. Koyko. Yeah, thank you. Sorry, I missed a question here. Um, I wanna go back uh, to Ms. Bia for the questions that I was asking about the affirmative action outreach plan that was written last year. Um, included a list of other groups, Association of Democratic Chairs, Small Business, Veterans, Education, Labor, and Faith, which we all love these caucuses and it's great that you have them. But because it was part of the affirmative action outreach plan, I'm wondering if these organizations would be included to have positions on the affirmative action committee or was it just you were listing through? I'm just trying to understand which groups will be part of the Affirmative Action Committee and will have members on the committee? Um, those are just in addition to what we're talking about as affirmative action. 
I'm trying okay. to find the, the ones that are list that are actually listed will be um, and those were the uh, African American, Native Americans, Asian Pacific, Latino. Uh, now women are in there. The women's group is in there, and the youth is in there. The young Democrats, um, LGBT seniors, and disabled vet disabled individuals. So, okay, it was a clarification based on what your affirmative action plan was last year, where you included right. these other groups. I just wanted to confirm that that's where we were going. Okay, and then I I too agree that I think that we have hit these points. However, and that the work has been going on. Um, but I want to just say, given maybe some recommendations and what Chair Biafor is agreeing to some of these other language changes that hopefully we give those recommendations and that, as she has stated, she will be taking those back to make those suggested changes that my colleagues are also making. But thank you so much, everybody, to the work that you're doing. For this. Thank you, Artie. Ms. Weicker? Um, yes, ma'am. I would like to call the question if, if, um, if that's okay. I think this has been thoroughly discussed and um, I uh, identify with Yvette Lewis as a state party chair. I feel like this has been a very thorough uh, in good faith effort of laying out a plan of action and I don't think it's our job to get down in the weeds. So I'd call the question. Great. Uh, as a reminder, uh, committee members, the motion on the table is to approve the updated bylaws as submitted by the West Virginia Democratic Party in accordance with the memorandum of understanding between the Rules and Bylaws Committee, the West Virginia uh, Democratic Party, and Ms. Vickers. At this time, I'll restate the motion that is on the table. Then the motion is, whereas the West Virginia Bylaws Committee conducted a comprehensive review of the bylaws and whereas the state party and the bylaws committee considered and proposed changes in the key areas required by the memorandum of understanding to ensure the West Virginia party is more diverse and inclusive and whereas the West Virginia Bylaws Committee discussed and considered additional views and proposals and have incorporated the spirit of these views in the document being reviewed by the Rules and Bylaws Committee today. Therefore, the motion is for the Rules and Bylaws Committee to approve the proposed bylaws as presented today and recommend approval and implementation of these by the state party in accordance with the agreement. All in favor, vote by aye. 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 I hadn't seen aye. that note that you sent me that the lady sent about the meeting, yeah. but she's been <laughs> communicating with Denise and then Denise asked me. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I missed all of that. I'm muted. <laughs> Okay. All opposed? It is it's opposed because the way this the way this reads is this committee is approving the bylaws as submitted. We've had a lot of happy talk and this and that, but right now the state chair can go back and say that the bylaws that she has proposed are have been approved by the DNC by the Rules and Bylaws Committee, and it, it seems to me that we are giving we are giving away we're giving way too much latitude here. She should come no. back with the changes before this committee approves anything. I want to make sure that we have the number of opposed. We'll make. Mr. Ickes, you are objecting. I, well, I'm opposed. I'm opposed. I'm opposed to the motion because for the reason that I just stated. That, 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 I, I understand, but that I, wasn't I, I, the question. For the vote. What? For the vote, I need to. I need a clarification that you are. You are a no. I am a no. Right. All right. 
Um, can the staff tell us um, the number from the the eyes? Okay. Um, all right. So the vote passes, and we will come. There was one opposed, uh, Mr. Ickes. We will uh, compile the West Virginia's uh, chair's comments and send them to her because we. She did make some commitments to us um, that she was going to uh, bring some of the changes that we had um, that you as committee members had offered. And so with that, the eyes have it and the bylaws have been approved. Jim? Thank you, uh, Lorraine. Uh, the uh, members, we've come to the end of our agenda for today. I would like to thank all of you for the time and the effort that you've given this very important process. It's taken us a little while, but I think we've had a full airing uh, of uh, uh, exactly uh, what this is about and points of view here. Uh, we couldn't do this work without all of your input. Uh, now that we have taken action on the bylaws, the West Virginia Democratic Party will have 30 days to adopt the amendments. And that would include the commitments that were made here today for clarifications and uh, uh, adjustments in those, uh, in those bylaws. In accordance with the agreement that we entered into, if the state party makes substantial changes to the version approved by the uh, Rules and Bylaws Committee here today, the updated version will need to be submitted back to this committee for final review and action before the amendments are finalized. Once the new bylaws have been adopted, the state party will have two months to implement any provisions. So this isn't, while this is the end of our action, unless it comes back to us, this isn't the end of the process, and I think uh, our BF4 uh, uh, understands that. Uh, and I see her nodding, so uh, <laughs> great. Uh, we will continue to keep you updated on this work, and we will pull this group together if needed to address any questions as they may arise. As I mentioned at the outset of our call, we'll be back in touch with you when we have more information to share about the logistics for our next meeting, where we uh, can look back at the 2020 nominating process, as we always do, and discuss how we can improve the process moving forward. Uh, that's not the formal beginning of the uh, delegate selection rules process for 2024, but it's to record what we've learned uh, during 2020. Uh, and we will also meet our commitment uh, uh, or our instructions under the convention resolution. Uh, the, uh, we will be at least in process toward, uh, toward full compliance with that. In the meantime, everyone, please stay healthy. Uh, go through the uh, sometimes difficult process of getting your vaccinations uh, and we, so that we will see you all again in person as soon as it's safe to do so. Mr. Chairman, this is yeah. oh. Patrice. If we could um, uh, call on Mr. Zodi, I know he um, had just a- no, I was doing that. Yeah. Oh, okay, thank you. Yeah, uh, sure. He wanted to say a few quick words. This is gonna be his last meeting as a RBC member. I'm sorry to interrupt, but he, you he just- You can't go. You can't go. Let me ask, ask our co-chair, Jim, if he was finished. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, I just, I. I appreciate the time. I just wanted to say, uh, everybody, this my chair, my term as chair is up on March 20th, so I won't be a DNC member anymore after that, <clears throat> and so uh, at least not in this capacity uh, for the foreseeable future. So I just wanted to say thank you to all of you. Um, this is a group of giants in democratic politics, and it's been really an honor to serve. We've spent a lot of time together, yeah. and uh, I can't tell you enough how substantive this experience has been for me, and um, <clears throat> I want to thank Chairman Perez for appointing me, and um, yeah, you guys are great, and I've relied on a number of you for things outside of this committee, but it really has been one of the things I will count as uh, 
one of my greatest activities in the Democratic Party. And so I can't thank you enough. I've been so glad to get to know all of you and I hope we can stay in touch, but I'll hold you all close uh, as we do in a Democratic family like this. So uh, best of luck to all of you. I hope to see you again. I uh, wish we could all be in person, but just not the way of the world right now. So I will uh, look forward to staying in touch with you as we can, but thank you for letting me serve. Thank you for answering my questions and educating me more on the rules of our party and letting me uh, uh, be an advocate where I can. So thanks a bunch. And uh, co-chairs Lorraine Miller and Jim Roosevelt, thank you for indulging me as well and uh, appreciate this time tonight. So see ya. John, thank you for all your work. Yeah. Uh, and as I said earlier, uh, you don't really get to go away. Yeah. <laughs> okay. No, happy to help any, uh, any way I can. So thank you very, thank you very much. Uh, glad, glad, uh, uh, glad uh, to hear from you. And it's been a great pleasure the working with you. Same to Frank Leon too. And yes, uh, also to Frank, uh, uh, who is also not going to be a formal member of the committee. Is not a formal member of the committee going forward, but again, has already demonstrated his uh, continuing commitment, uh, as, as, as has Bishop Daughtry, but she's going to have to be a formal uh, <laughs> participant as well. So uh, unless anybody has any other, uh, any other uh, matters to come before the committee, I will entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. So moved. And moved. Is there a second? Second. 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 Okay, it's been moved and seconded. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed no. no. Yes. Hey, Mayor. We hey. are adjourned. Thank yeah. you all very much. Awesome, everybody. Thank you. Bye bye. Everybody. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Take care, everyone. Bye, bye David. <laughs> bye.